Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar on embedding social enterprise into the recovery. My name is Theodora Haji Michael. I'm the Chief Executive of Responsible Finance. This webinar today is part of a series of webinars that Responsible Finance is holding called 10 Times RF in order to increase awareness about the crucial role that our members, Community Development Finance Institutions, or CDFIs, have. Today, we're really pleased to have MP Danny Kruger here with us. Danny is a longtime supporter of the social enterprise sector. This support includes his 2020 report on leveling up our communities, which was commissioned by the prime minister and his new venture, the Social Covenant Unit. Through this work, Danny engages extremely closely with the social enterprise and the social investment communities. And so he understands their needs really thoroughly. And equally, obviously, working in government, he works with the prime minister and across government departments. So he has this really unique position of understanding what each side needs and how each side works and being able to translate across. And we're hoping he'll do some of that translating for us today. So Danny has about 20 minutes with us this afternoon. So let's get started. Thank you, Danny. So first up, um, so your report last year on leveling up our communities received really broad acclaim for its ideas about civil society and addressing regional inequalities. Since then, you campaigned to extend the Social Investment Tax Relief, or SITR. Um, so thinking about the SITR extension and the discussions around what follows it, how do you think government can stimulate a boom in the social economy during the recovery? Thanks for that and, and for your intro. I, um, I'm very much in, in the hands of the experts on this question. You guys and others uh, really made the case for the SITR extension as you made it for the original relief when it was introduced. Um, and I was really keen that we did manage to extend its life. It would have been a great shame, I think, in the year of G7 uh, to terminate a relief, which was actually set up in the wake of the last time the UK hosted the, the G7 or the G8, as it then was, uh, in under David Cameron, 2013, around that time. And, uh, you know, for all the challenges that that relief has had, and I don't blame the idea or the sector for the challenges. I'm afraid I blame the way it's been, uh, it was introduced and managed uh, by government. Again, no particular blame attaching to individuals or institutions. It's just a difficult thing to get right. And it takes a while for these sorts of uh, financial products, as it were, to, uh, to, to gain traction with investors. And I think that's what we are now seeing. But so it would have been a great shame to terminate it. I think that still it's a shame that it's only been extended two years. And I think I'm afraid to say, sorry for government, that we're going to have to continue the campaign uh, to to give it a further lease of life because the um, you know two years isn't really enough for that investor confidence to build. So I think we need to do more on that front. Uh, but there's a whole range of other issues and ideas that, again, I, I sourced from from far and wide, people working in the social economy and, the, and civil society to present my uh, my report. And, and, and they, they range from, you know, work with, uh, on, on the digital agenda, I think there's a huge opportunity for civil society generally and the social economy in particular to harvest the benefits of, of data and digital more effectively. Uh, I mean, some social enterprises are absolutely leading the world in, 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 in this, but some are massive laggards. And in, you know, the charity sector, if we can describe it, you know, the wider civil society in general, I'm afraid is, well, in fact, it's an opportunity because there's a big low hanging fruit here to make real uh, you know, added value through upskilling people and improving the use of data and digital in our, in our sector. Uh, and there are proposals around that. I think when we could think, think about money, though, the opportunities are, are partly in commissioning. There's enormous, you know, hundreds of billions of pounds a year spent by government on uh, goods and services. And I think we need to be much more deliberate as a country in saying that public money should be spent on obviously private enterprises, but those which are, uh, are serving the public good, not just in the service that, that, are, that is procured by government, but in their wider operations. Are they locally based? Are they employ local people do they have a uh you know a sustainable strategy around uh about people place and the environment uh and uh and and do they operate in a way that is a, is a wider social value so we need to build on the social value act which the uh which, which parliament passed 10 years ago so i think as a, as a commissioning agenda and then finally um 
there's 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 direct funding and i think we have a opportunity now as we're redesigning the support which which places and uh and social causes get as we leave the eu with the phasing out the uh, structural funding to introduce this new fund which the government's committed to this the uh shared prosperity fund and other funds i mean there's a leveling up fund which was announced um which reflected some of what I've been calling for in my reports, so I was pleased to see. Uh, and this money has to be more, about more than just the sort of bare bones of economic infrastructure. It needs to be about what we call social infrastructure uh, and supporting the sorts of projects in the sorts of places that, that need levelling up through uh, through creating the foundations for growth, which is strong communities. And, and again, I think a major opportunity for the social economy, the social enterprise sector to be major beneficiaries of those funds. Great. And I think the finance funding part is something we want to touch on later in this conversation, just given our role and our members' role as place-based lenders. Um, But first, you touched on sort of what makes up the social economy. And I wondered if you could um, tell us a bit more. Um, You know, in your report, you say that the social enterprises have a vital role in what you call fixing broken markets from within. And I wondered if you could talk a bit more and tell us a bit more mm. what you mean by that. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, if you think about the challenges that the places we shouldn't really call left behind, but, um, you know, the, the same places that, frankly, have been disadvantaged for generations in this country. We know the maps just haven't changed. They haven't really changed since the 1930s. We often look back to the 70s and 80s as the time when things started going wrong. But actually, this, this is this is, this is a 100-year cycle that we're, we're in of... Uh, of, of challenge for particular places in the north and the midlands particularly also coastal areas uh, and and some pockets in the countryside as well so there are entrenched social challenges and and what they what they suffer is is a vicious circle of of low investment in both you know capital you know in plant you know in in, in sort of kit that creates wealth and jobs and low investment in people and you know the the uk particularly in recent decades, has had a poor record of a private sector investment in, in, in plant and people. And, uh, and, and uh, so you've got that on the private sector. And then on the public sector in these places, you have a, 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 a real problem, which is that the bulk of public spending is going on, you know, generally on welfare costs, so particularly adult social care. Uh, this is in all areas of the country, um, but it, it's particularly hard, hard in places which have a low tax base. So the, uh, the local authority won't have a lot of money after it's covered its care costs, which means that less spending can go on social infrastructure and on placemaking, on making a community attractive to businesses and to people. So you get, again, the lack of investment uh, and, 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 and people uh, leaving if they can. Um, and... Uh, and, and so fixing this challenge, particularly around private sector investments, feels to me our, one of our key challenges as a country. How do we get businesses to invest in the places where we need investment to happen, rather than just chasing, you know, blowing up the bubble of the southeast even more? And partly we can fix that with government policy. So, you know, directly investing, uh, incentivizing private investment. And, you know, Rishi Sunak has been very honest about this, you know, corporation tax cuts uh, haven't succeeded in driving up private sector investment. So what we've got now is a plan for the super deduction uh, tax break, which is, will directly incentivize investment in, in in machinery. So I think that I hope we're going to get our we're going to improve the tax regime around investment. Also, we're committed to a big skills agenda. Further announcements were made on that this week. So I think there's a kind of external fixing broken markets from the outside is 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 underway. I hope, but the great opportunity that the social economy represents is fixing them from within, as I say, and that and that's because social enterprises, and I include the finance sector, which you guys uh, represent in this, you know, you've just got such a good record about investing in people, you know, social enterprises invest more traditionally in, in skills and in reskilling and in their people. Uh, you circulate the profits that you create uh, locally. Uh, you have a more patient approach to, to uh, return on investment. Uh, and just by the sorts of businesses that you set up, you create the social infrastructure that makes places livable and makes them attractive and supports the skills base, the that foundational uh, economy or, or sort of pre-economy 
the, 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 the gathering places of a community that enable, uh, that, that give places a sense of pride in themselves and give people a desire to stay. So uh, just the, the, the presence of a social economy is essential to the part of this sort of ecology of a community. So um, the more social enterprise you have in a place, the more intrinsic strength it has. And that is why, what I mean by fixing markets from within. So not about having just grand macro industrial strategy, which obviously I totally see the need of, um, or, or major investments in rail or, or, or even broadband, vital, totally vital as that is. The, the, the great benefit of the social economy is that it does the work uh, intrinsically and, uh, and, uh, and, 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 and lays the foundations for the more sort of traditional commercial economy. And part of that um, sort of coming from within and that place-based nature is around, you know, you've talked about having national funding, but it's also about local funding. And you've talked before about um, having this idea of having local pots of money that gets invested and reinvested into communities. And at Responsible Finance, we're really interested in that given our network of place-based mm -hmm. lenders and the lending expertise um, and the market reach and trust that we have. What do you think, um, how do you think these, or how do you see these local capital pools being managed and where ideally does the money come from? Well, uh, it's a good question. I mean, obviously, the, there's no, it's not doesn't come from a single place, uh, and you know, ultimately, we're about generating growth in the private economy that can be recycled locally. So ultimately, it should be coming from successful businesses, you know, repaying loans and uh, and, and creating a virtuous circle locally. Um, but I think there is an obvious case for uh, seed capital for these sorts of. Uh, in, in investment models and I, I mean I, I just think there's a bunch of different opportunities here I would be using the uh, dormant assets fund, funding that's going to come on stream you know uh, billions of pounds of, uh, of dormant insurance accounts are going to be liberated we hope with the support of the insurance industry in the coming years uh, there's a question mark about where that, how that is spent what, what's the best use of it I think I can we can all think of very, lots of very good ideas for that including I think a big agenda around personal finance might well be an opportunity to basically to fix our debt uh, problems by creating a you know a brilliant network of credit unions or or, or other sort of retail um, uh, banks um, but but equally supporting the uh, social enterprise economy through CDFIs and others. I would completely support that use of, of dormant assets money. And there are other smaller pots around, like I'm, I'm very interested in what's going to happen to the National Fund, which is 500 million pounds worth of money that we're hoping the government's going to support um, the, the the allocation of, uh, for, you know, it's a dormant, it's a, it's a massive dormant bank account, basically, it hasn't been used. Uh, it's in the high court at the moment. So there might, there, there'll be opportunities there. And I've mentioned that a shared prosperity fund, the levelling up fund. I hope these. I hope the government's prepared to be innovative with those pots and effectively uh, distribute the allocation of them to trusted intermediaries and to places, regional uh, agencies that can uh, hand hand out that money without too much control from the centre. So I think that you know there are opportunities there. And then you know why not be tapping up big tech talking to big corporates about what their, how they use their, uh, both their investment um, uh, capital, but, but also, you know, what residual corporate philanthropy that they have should be bigger. Uh, I think, you know, us as individuals, you know, what opportunities have we got to, to, to put our investments into these sorts of institutions? I just think we should be generally crowding in money from all sources um, and, and, you know, as I've mentioned, ultimately, this is good use of money. This will this will this will earn returns over the long term, uh, and, cre and help create an economy that we we all want to be part of. So, I think there's lots to be uh, hopeful. Yes, and it's interesting you mentioned big tech um, because when I mean for the CDFI sector, when thinking about scaling, unlocking private sector capital. Um, is always the holy grail and is always that is what 
can fuel um, much faster scaling up of the CDFI sector and the social lending sector. And we look at the, the US and we see, you know, not only are banks investing heavily into CDFIs, but lately we see the tech companies investing as well. In the past year, Netflix, Google, Facebook, PayPal have all put hundreds of millions of dollars into the CDFI sector because they see it as this really effective way of reaching um, underserved communities and reaching communities that need the money the most. And so what would, um, you know, what would your ask be of the corporate and capital sector here so that we can get that culture of um, community investment um, at the same at the same level? Yeah, well, that's very encouraging. Just just before I answer, tell me, do you think they're doing that for political and sort of cosmetic reasons or is that hard headed commercial decision making on their part? There's probably a mix of both. I mean, we're encouraged by the um, the strong ESG agenda that that's risen um, quite quickly during COVID, just because of the the level of um, social inequality that has come to yeah. the fore. I think in the U.S., I mean, it's it looks like it's broadly been driven by the impact of the pandemic being very clear um, on the most disadvantaged and lowest income communities. Yeah. And then um, just the the sort of transparency that we've seen the the level of racial injustice in the U.S. A lot of these companies have put money into CDFIs specifically in order to reach um, okay. black and other minority ethnic led yeah. businesses and um, and minority communities. So I think part of it is um, a feeling of social responsibility in the wake of. Uh, tremendous yeah. social inequality yeah okay well that's helpful yeah i mean uh, well i mean we should be maximizing on that that feeling here too and uh i mean uh i mean i think big tech is is on a journey social media is on a journey certainly um from the idea of the global citizen to to, to, to the local citizen and the recognition that actually we are connected and we want to be connected in real life and to people who live around us and tech should be enabling that rather than disrupting that and you know increasingly you see the rhetoric from facebook and others about supporting uh communities of place um and i really you know endorse that and wish they you know give 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 full credit to them for recognizing that that's what they should be doing so i think we should be maximizing Building on that sensation uh, that, that we see, and uh, and and, but but it has to be a two-way conversation unless we are to you know go the whole hog. And you know there are arguments, frankly, you know, channeling Teddy Roosevelt for for you know having a very serious conversation about the size of these tech giants. Uh, I, I I think it's pretty unacceptable that so much of our lives now are mediated through a very small number of enormous firms. Um, so I think we do need to have a conversation about big tech. And how big it is but even you know in the meantime let's have a respectful conversation with those firms about what they can and should be doing to support our communities and uh and that means i think um saying to them you know yes you need to pay your taxes but also as good citizens what role do you want to play in strengthening civil society and in, in the places that need it and so rather than telling them i think we should do this we should have a conversation i am in fact as it happens in a conversation with tech firms and with community groups um, and mediated th through my my friends in an outfit called Neighbourly Lab who are in this space and trying to try and understand what is it that community groups, civil society organisations would like from big tech. And what we're getting back is, well, we, they don't want big tech to have a bigger role in community life. They don't want to be giving up data. They don't want to be handing over any kind of power. But they do want the uh, some... Uh, access to the data that big tech collects on places which probably be, should be owned and used by communities and they and they want their money and you know how can big tech firms be financially supporting civil society and helping to create a properly digitally wired civil society which as I said is a big opportunity um, but to do that in a way that doesn't empower the tech firms at the expense of communities is obviously the, the, the challenge for us how do we do this in a way that works um, 
and doesn't aggravate the problems. So I think, a, as I say, a sort of respectful conversation, I think the people in the tech firms would want this to be got right, at least I hope they would. Um, and uh, uh, and we need to we need to have a conversation with them about how how what they can do. Certainly they've got the assets which could and should be exploited uh, for the public benefit. And do you feel like that's an area where you touched you, know, you touched on SITR before um, as an incentive for channeling investment into social purpose? Um, but also there's the mm. community investment tax relief CITR. Yeah. Um, which is a, not, a little known, but also effective mechanism. Is that what you see providing these incentives? Um, is that what you see the role of how the government can can pull together this partnership that's much needed? I think. I mean, I think the whole conversation around tax is got to be part of the part of it. Uh, I mean, I think we want a really robust uh, and supportive tax regime that, that that supports social enterprise, and it might be that we consolidate. SITR, CITR, and expand them. I mean, I would, I want to be much more ambitious. Uh, obviously, uh, the, the, but I think the conversation with big tech needs to. We need to be careful not to get into a sort of transactional arrangement whereby we offer them tax reliefs to do the right thing. I mean, if, if, if indeed there are legitimate disincentives to doing the right thing that the tax system is creating, then let's look at that. But really, they should be paying more tax, and those big firms, and they should also be. Uh, helping directly, whether it's pro bono, in kind, or, or or with further philanthropic contributions, and I think actually, you know, obviously we all do make the distinction between philanthropy and tax. We all know what that's like in our own lives, the difference between being taxed and giving money. But actually, this is a continuum, and I think that firms should see, shouldn't see some, you know, massive distinction between the money that they contribute through taxation and the money that they're contributing directly, because they're, it's all part of supporting us, you know, creating a sustainable economy and society and 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 you know given the incredible opportunity these firms have to make money um thanks to the regulatory environment that they operate in in our countries um we should have a very robust and uh, respectful but a, but a you know very deliberate conversation about how they are you know earning their profits and uh and what they're doing for society in return, and uh, and and rather, or rather, how to make a society that continues to be pr- prosperous, uh, and what their role is in that. So, um, but but yes, I mean, the tax system is uh, has got to be a big part of that. Um, yeah. Okay, great. And I know um, you have to run in a couple minutes. Um, so, last question for you. Um, so we. Um, clearly think that the social lending sector as as the one of the current biggest drivers of investment into the social economy and into um, into communities um, is an underutilized tool in the UK and throughout this campaign um, we've been saying it's the best kept secret in the finance system. Mm. Um, we often look across to the U.S. CDFI sector, which has, which currently lends ten times per capita what we do here, and that level of scale has largely been driven by um, by government, both in terms of funding into the sector, but also favorable legislation. So. What do you think? Um, how do you think that the UK, that our social lending sector, can convince our government to provide this kind of encouragement? What do you think is holding it back? What would you tell us um, to do to cut through? Thanks. Well, very interesting. I'd love to explore that, and with, with, if we have more time, I mean, the, the, I'd be interested to know. I'm not asking because there's no time, but I mean, I would, I would like to know whether that success in the US is related to your decentralized politics, which is you've got a states, you know, you, whether these are local, you know, state level CDFIs or, or or below, and whether it's the regimes of local of of, of local jurisdictions, states that that are enabling that and driving it. Because I think that the great merit of the US is that you have competition between states. And uh, and I think we and one of our, and the other example country to look at obviously in this regard is Germany where they have a very strong um, local banking sector and that's again because they have a more decentralised system I think um, so I I for me this is all bound up in our over centralised unitary British state that we have and um, or English state and uh, uh, and and just we need 
you know, we need a regional polity, you know, regional politics and regional banking. And they're related closely in my mind. Um, and, uh, you know, what we have is, you know, just through coronavirus, we've seen government ha- working through what's there, which is, you know, these, these, this small number of very big banks, um, you know, getting its loans and, and, uh, and so on out. Uh, and, you know, a lot of businesses have had a lot of, have had a pretty, pretty frustrating time dealing with these big banks. Um, and I wish we had a local banking system that could have taken more of the uh, burden during coronavirus. So, um, yes, we need to do better in this country. And it, you're right, there is this bizarre kind of shroud of secrecy or of ignorance over uh, social lending. I, you know, th- I think that is beginning to change. Uh, and I think there is increasing recognition of the need for change, and you guys represent that, and your members do. It's really encouraging to see what's happening around the place. You know, I'm a big supporter of Avon Mutual in my bit of uh, southwest England. Um, you know, a new bank uh, set up to lend locally, and you know there are. I think I think the, the tide is beginning to turn in our favour. But um, and you know the, the extension of SRTR in a sense is a straw in the wind in that to that effect. So I'm I'm what you can do to make the case i'm afraid there's no simple answer you're doing it you know demonstrating those points i made earlier about this is these are this is this is good investment um this is this this social enterprises invest better and for longer in people and places and social lenders support the kind of businesses that we need so uh you know i think you're making the case as, as ever badgering mps is is helpful and uh you know pursuing uh, you've got a bunch of treasury ministers i think who who are very supportive in principle to this agenda um but they're all distracted and they've all got to, got to work in the status quo which is our current centralized system with a small number of very big players who are naturally resistant to new entrants um but so it's a slow process i'm afraid unless anyone's got some brilliant idea to land uh on, on government um i'd be very happy to pick up and run with um uh so so let me know how i can help going forward but i i think we are building a quite a strong movement here and uh congratulations to all your members for their their absolutely invaluable work uh in our country and to you guys for championing the sector so well oh thank you danny well thank you um it's been a really interesting discussion um about the the wider um, landscape and the untapped potential of the social finance sector and it's good to hear your optimism that tides are changing and the message is starting to cut through um, albeit slowly um, so I want to thank you again Danny for making time for us today especially on short notice I think that really speaks to your passion and commitment for the sector um, which you've also demonstrated through your your long-term ongoing supports. Um, and I also want to thank everyone in our audience today for joining. We've had over 50 um, attendees today, which is absolutely brilliant. I hope you've all found this discussion as refreshing and thought-provoking as I have. Um, so do check out the Responsible Finance website for more information about our events. And if you'd like to find out more about CDFIs or work with us, please do get in touch. So thank you again, Danny and everyone else. Goodbye. Bye-bye.